Hi, I'm Alan, and today I'd like to present to you my 1978 Honda CB750A Honda I've owned this bike for several years now. I was looking for something different, something that I hadn't had before. Um, and this piqued my interest when I ran across it in an ad. I uh, went out to see the machine and found out that it had just been brought out of storage where it had been stored since the mid 80s. And um, it only had 4,000 miles on it when I got it. Then was the process for me to wake it up and a, a bit of a discovery process because I had never balanced four carbs before, let alone taken four carburetors apart to clean them and then put them back on and get everything going. Uh, I, I got it all done and she started up uh, first thing, but not on ethanol fuel. Um, fortunately, I live close to a RV dealership in RVs, they uh, use generators, and the generators cannot run on ethanol fuel, so those dealerships have pumps for that. With the 90 octane that she would have had in 1978, she runs perfectly. Let's look at some of the, the differences. In 1978, I'll just point out, was the most refined model of the Honda CB750A. Progressively, from 1975 to 1978, Honda does one very good thing, and uh, that is they listen to their customers and they innovate based on what their customers tell them. And then once they implement the, the innovation, they test it and test it um, to make sure that it's not going to fail. And so the 1975 machine is quite a bit different from the 1978 machine because every year were innovations and improvements, the 1978 being the finest and the last, and sadly the rarest because due to a policy which, um, if I were ever to write a book on how to make an item fail, um, Honda really did it. Um, they had a bad advertising campaign. You meet the nicest people on a Honda. They had a, a really uh, bad uh, concept. They wanted you to believe that this was a learner bike. And that's absolutely crazy. And then they didn't promote it very well. The next thing, um, which was really nutty, was that they detuned it. They detuned it so that it wouldn't compete with the standard model uh, Honda CB750s. And until a definitive book is written about these that nails down the facts, um, until a Honda CB750A Hondamatic club is formed, they uh, build an archive of factual information. Then it's stories that I hear every now and again. Getting back to this machine, the Comstock wheels, uh, which was unique for 1978. All the other models had the wire wheels of the previous years. Um, <clears throat> when, when you look at this engine on this side, instead of a Kickstarter and a clutch cover, what's immediately apparent right here is the torque converter. And the torque converter is not uncommon on automatic transmissions, but on this transmission, what it means is that you can, like your car, if you have an automatic car, you can put it in gear and just hold the brake and it doesn't go anywhere. Take your foot off the brake and it goes somewhere. Riding this, 90% of the time, I don't even use first gear. I just snick it up twice, put it into uh, second or drive, and I use that all the time. With this bike, 
from zero to 100 miles an hour. You don't shift gears. It's just a constant push, a constant acceleration as you get up to 100 miles an hour. It's rated to do 110, and in a moment I'll give you a demonstration, and I think I get up to 100 miles an hour, um, or very close to it. I test drove a, uh, an electric bike recently, and uh, I was struck by the similarity of the application of power and the smoothness, how it was so similar to the Hondamatic. The only other bike, and I haven't ridden it, but I've, I've heard descriptions of it that I guess would come close, would be the uh, turbine uh, motorcycles um, that's built by that company in Florida. Now, they go obviously a lot faster than this machine, but this doesn't cost as much as that does, and it doesn't cost as much as an electric bike does. And when it comes to the electric bike, you have to recharge it for eight hours, and this takes five minutes to fill it up. So, on the trade-off, this bike, which is now an antique bike, is still years ahead of its time. Now, let's uh, go and look at some of the features on this machine, and we'll cover them on this side, and then we'll go to the other side. So, I'll go into handheld mode now. Okay, so here we are on handheld mode, and the first thing you'll notice that uh, the front wheel as well as the rear wheel are for the 1978 model. They have the Comstock wheels, which I think looks pretty good on this machine, considering that it's so far ahead of its time. Uh, it was just a natural evolution from the spoke wheels. And you'll see also that mine is fitted with the Windjammer 3 fairing and uh, the matching uh, pannier bags. And uh, that was a, a period thing that people did for long distance cruising. And it makes the bike just that much better, in my opinion. In any event, we come over here and look at that beautiful engine. Okay, in fact, just take in the total overall beauty of this bike, how how well put together it is. Okay, so anyways, one thing I notice about, about this machine is that it just doesn't have a plain Jane side. From any way you approach it, it looks good. Unlike many other machines where there is always a side you park against the wall and the side that you sat there and you looked at. Okay, so Coming down on the bike itself, we'll look at some of the features here. And that is the torque converter right there. This is the rear brake. But this unit in here has some springs and a ratchet device. This is the electrical switch sender. And this is the cable that operates a ratchet because when you push down on the brake and you hold it down, and then you push, pull up on a button that this is connect to, connected to on the other side, what happens is it engages a ratchet which keeps the rear brake locked on. So that's your parking brake, which is a very neat idea. If you've ever parked this on a hill, you just set the parking brake and it, it's not going anywhere. So now we're going to come up and look at some more features. Now I am told I haven't verified this, but I'm told that the saddle hinges on the opposite side of the other bikes, which is kind of interesting that that was a difference they made. And as we look in here, this is the kickstart handle. And the kickstart handle attaches the motor on the uh, left side of the bike, sort of Ducati style, in case uh, you have a problem with your battery and uh, this will get the bike uh, starting very quickly. It starts really easily with this. And when we come up here, right here, this uh, opens up and inside is the uh, rider's instruction manual. And then over here, that's the uh, uh, bike tool kit that came with the bike. Very neat, nicely stowed. 
That, of course, is the battery down there, but it comes out the side cover to the side over there. <clears throat> and this, I love this little deal. Uh, this is where you put the uh, ring on your helmet harness. You put it on here, that little metal uh, ring, so that when you close the saddle, no one can steal your helmet. And though I know it's it's like cool or chic to stick your handle your helmet on your handlebar, um, I've actually seen people have their helmet stolen, and then they're sitting there. They can't go anywhere because they don't have a helmet. Well, some will brave it and just run home without a helmet, but still, you know, it's enough to ruin your day. Here's another nice thing I like, and that is hiding the fuel cap. And there's your fuel sender. But another thing that Honda was so thoughtful of was look at this. You can't lose your fuel cap. Now, I don't know about you, but... I've dropped fuel caps, you know, in the past, and do they ever land by my feet? No, they always roll 20 feet away and under someone's car, you know, so that is a real savior right there. Now, if we go over to the controls here, of course, there's no clutch, okay, but you do have your turn signals, your horn, and your high beam, low beam. And we come over here to the instruments, and this is your ignition switch right here. There's your choke. Uh, there's your uh, speedometer. And here's your instrument cluster. Um, instead of a tachometer, which would be kind of pointless on this machine, it, you know, a lot of cars today, uh, they're automatic and they come with a tack. Uh, do you ever look at the tack when you're driving on an automatic? Not really. But anyways, um, uh, this one uh, here, when I put on the ignition switch, there's your oil, your neutral. If you're in one or two, these light up alternatively. And over on this side, there's your high beam, high beam on, it's sort of dim. Okay, and then your parking. When I demonstrate the parking brake here, okay, and whoop, uh, there it is. Okay, all right, one-handed putting on the parking brakes, a lot of fun. All right, and uh, then you've got your turn signals, okay, and uh, your fuel gauge, of course, you know. It's a very sophisticated setup. We come over here, there's your uh, uh, kill switch, your starter button, and of course, this is an aftermarket uh, cruise control. If you have a Hondamatic, I'd say make sure you get one of these on the left side of the bike, <clears throat> the other side. And as you can see, it just does not have a plain Jane side, this machine. It's beautiful. And if we go in closer, <clears throat> I'm going to point some things out. This right here, that's the parking brake knob that you pull out when you depress the um, brake, rear brake lever. When you want to disengage the parking brake, you push in the center button and push this right over. <clears throat> then you just uh, push down on the uh, brake lever and uh, you'll hear a click and the parking brake is released. Here is the fuel pet cock. Well, nothing so remarkable it seems about this, except that on these machines, the correct fuel pet cock, the <clears throat> Uh, fuel pipe uh, connects this way onto the back. It doesn't come out the side. And I know aftermarket people try to sell the ones out the side, but look what happens when you connect a fuel line on here. You've got this in the way, and if you turn it around, it hits the rocker box. So the correct ones come directly out the back. And as we go down here, and <clears throat> this is the gear selector, but rather than going in uh, through mechanical means of turning a quadrant and the quadrant uh, uh, selecting positions for the slider forks and moving different gears into different alignments, this is connected uh, to a fluid diverter switch. 
and when I do a video on how the gearbox works I'll get more into what the fluid diverter switch does but <clears throat> essentially it uh, sends fluid to one of two clutches engaging one of two uh, gear ratios down uh, right here this little stub that is where the uh, uh, Kickstarter goes on you just flick this pedal up put the Kickstarter on and there you go now below the gear selector is another deal right back in here and it's connected by a rod over here onto the side stand and what this does is that if you're in gear and you put down the side stand it puts it into neutral and not only that when the side stand is down you cannot put her into gear this of course is where you fill up the oil and it has a dipstick in there remember that this is a wet sump engine not a dry sump engine now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how easy this bike starts okay and we'll come over here and we'll turn on the gas I'm going to just grab the header pipe here and you can see that she's absolutely cold well as cold as can be on an 85 degree day and I will apply a little bit of choke okay about there and remember that she's running on 90 octane so here we go ignition and we come over here and hit the starter bit of throttle take off the choke 